Good evening, Crawfordsville. It's not quite six o'clock yet. A few more minutes and we'll be discussing a brief history of kites. Three minutes and counting down. I'll be your host this evening. My name is Stephanie Morissette. Tonight's program was intended to be a non-narrated program, so an on your own viewing of the presentation. However, on second thought, I thought why not just present it live? And so it is actually live this evening. So I welcome those of you who will be tuning in and reading along with us this evening. Got a couple minutes here. Just a little filling in of the spaces in between. I really uh, have a personal interest in kites, a lot of good childhood memories. My father has a lot of kites, and so I had a lot of good memories that were made with him and, and flying his different types of kites. I'm not sure he might even be listening in tonight. One minute warning. Again, welcome Montgomery County, Crawfordsville, and all you outlying areas to tonight's program, A Brief History of Kites. It's now six o'clock. I'd like to welcome you again. My name is Stephanie Morissette, and for your listening pleasure this evening, I will be narrating the slides. Uh, I was mentioning a few minutes ago in just some uh, opening conversation that I have a personal interest in kites. And since April is National Kite Month, I thought, well, here's a great little program to put together uh, because who doesn't enjoy flying a kite? The first and earliest kites were made from leaves and what people would do, early peoples would take the leaves and roll them up on the edges, sort of forming the frame of what we know as our traditional kite shape. And then they would find spider silk, my clock, <laughs> they would find spider silk and loop it around the base of the leaf with a little bit of bait on the end of that spider web and then float the leaf on the water in the hopes that a fish might be attracted to the bait and then they could therefore use their nets to scoop up the fish. Kites were once thought to be talismans that warded off evil spirits, probably because the way in which kites can move and dance through the air. So might have been frightening to evil spirits. And on a positive note, kites were used to represent that a good harvest should come. The first kites, as we know them, were made between two and 3,000 years ago in China. And the earliest accounts in China of kites were in the Han Dynasty. But as kites grew in their popularity after a certain period of time, which we'll discuss here in a moment, they spread across Asia and through Japan and then on into Europe and even Africa and then into the Americas. So they became a worldwide sensation over time. But these earliest kites again, they were made from bamboo and paper and were typically shaped like birds. 
later developed into a decorated wind sock and even into uh, banners that were used for uh, various things. We'll see that in the next slide here. And then kites lifted paper lanterns. Only the wealthy Chinese or the military had the ability to fly kites. Uh, one, they were probably pretty expensive to have them to have kites made during that time period. But military used the kites to um, know where their corps or their armies were at certain times if they saw the kites flying in the air. And they could also observe their enemy if their enemy had a kite nearby, they might know where their army was marching to or from. Kites as banners were used for the royalty. So the earliest kite-like banners were only for royal families. But again, as kites grew in popularity, more people wanted to be able to have access to them. And as they spread throughout the world, in Polynesia, they even still have kite duels. And the person who can fly their kite the highest was considered to be blessed by their god Rango. Moving into our history, kites have been used as instruments of discovery. As we know, in 1752, Ben Franklin was studying electricity and he utilized a kite with the key tied to it in order to further his studies of electricity. In 1899, we're all familiar with the Wright brothers and the invention of their first airplane. And they actually used a, a bi-level kite to do their first experiments. And then this helped them later develop and contribute to the evolution of the early airplane. Kites can even carry people if all the factors in the kite are correct. And we'll talk about four different forces of kites that affect kites that would give them the capability with the proper structure and design to lift people. And these are historical photographs. So, in 1833, the US Weather Bureau used kites to help them measure wind speed and temperature at different altitudes. And as kites progressed in their structure and design, these elements really lended to the fact that the Weather Bureau could make better observations. And so their scientific information would be more accurate. You could see two examples here. And during World War II in 1941 in New York City, the Barrage Balloon and Kite School opened and it was dedicated to anti-craft instrumentation so that they could study their enemy in various non-intrusive ways. Moving up into the kites we have today, it's a great big skip and a jump from then to now, but we have so many wonderful kites. In 1980, the World Kite Museum opened in Washington State and quote, they are dedicated to the thrill, art, science, sport, and history of kites worldwide. And I just think that sounds fun. So I had to say it like that. Kites have played an important part in our history and in multicultural arts and festivals, different celebrations, and all the early design elements brought together with modern day design has really come up with some creative kites. In 1964, the American Kite Flyers Association was formed. And in August, there's an international kite festival. And as I mentioned, April is National Kite Month and we should all get out and fly a kite. And hopefully we will here soon. I discussed that there were forces that acted on kites. So for the physics of kites, we want to know how and why do kites fly? Well, we need to know about the four forces that affect kites. Those forces are gravity, lift, thrust, and drag. Gravity, as we know, is the force that pulls everything towards the earth. And so a heavy kite would be harder to fly because it has a greater weight. So the force of gravity would pull stronger. Lift, however, it, it slows the force of gravity by pushing the kite away from the earth. And this happens as air that moves faster over the top of the kite 
coincides with air that moves along under the bottom of the kite. So the kite is able to compensate for the wind and gravity while having the ability to stay aloft. And shape is really important in maximizing the lift for a kite. And that's why there are so many different kinds of kites. Thrust is simply the force that moves the kite forward through the air. And then finally, we have drag. And drag, as it sounds like, is friction. And it's caused by, it can be caused by the texture of your kite fabric, even the string, if you have a different weight of string on your kite. Uh, if you have a tail or don't have a tail on your kite, uh, sometimes tails can help balance out drag and keep it more stable and upright. Those four forces of, of flight that we discussed, thrust, lift, drag, and gravity, have a lot of variables that factor into how well your kite will fly. And some of those factors are included in this list here, which are size of the kite, the kite's balance and bridling. Bridling is a part of the structure where the string attaches to a portion of the kite. And we're gonna talk about the skeleton structure of kites here in just a minute, so you'll get a better idea of what I'm talking about. Wind speed is a factor, the steadiness of the kite in the air or the turbulence of the air, what altitude the kite is flying, the material the kite is made of, whether or not the kite has a tail, and then having a flexible frame that, that has enough flex to it that will be able to maintain the force of thrust, lift, drag, and gravity. Kite anatomy. Here is a simple kite plan, a diamond kite, or it's in the flat kite category. It has the skeleton of the kite is composed of two spars. The spine is the spar that runs vertically from the top of the kite to the bottom. And then the cross spar is simply the spar that crosses over from wingtip to wingtip. The leading edge of the kite is simply the top portion of the angles of, of the material that come towards the top edge. It's the leading edge. And the trailing edge, same, down towards the end of the kite. The bridle is the line that connects to the kite to the flying line and then the actual bridling point is the point where the bridle and the kite flying line attaches so they're all right in there together if you look at where the cross spar and the spine meet the cross in the center of the kite that's where you would have your bridle lots of different kites there are lots of different variables of kites within different types of kite classes these are some of the few that we're gonna look at briefly. We're gonna talk frequently about the flat kite, uh, box kites. We'll see some examples of sled kites as well as a delta kite. And well, really pretty much we're gonna see examples of all these kites. There are distinctly different types of kites and there are really four categories, uh, flat kites, which again, is like the image we see in this picture. That's a typical flat kite. It's a single line kite, so it only has one point of line attachment. These can come in various shapes. We'll see images of those here in a minute, but to mention those names and those types, some of them are delta, diamond-shaped kite, like this one here, a parafoil, figure kites, inflatable kites, sled kites and train kites. Train kites, if you look at the background image to the slides that we're viewing here, that is a typical train kite. All these types of flat kites that we've just mentioned are considered relaxing kites. They're fun and enjoyable to fly. The next category is sport kites. And they consist of dual and quad line kites or kites that have two strings attached or four strings attached. These would be your stunt kites that allow for more interactive movements within the flight capabilities of your kite, allowing it to do various uh, tricks like flips and dips, dives and stalls, and just really become creative. Power kites or power foils, kite sailing and bow kites. These are used more for what I would consider power sports or extreme sports. We'll see some 
great examples here in a couple slides. And finally, rotor kites are going to be the ones that we discussed just briefly, and they're round or circular kites that actually move through the air in a circular motion. Here are two examples of flat kites. You can see the peripheral kites on the left, and then on the right we see the figure kite. So it's still considered um, a flat kite, but it is a figure kite within the flat kite category. There we go. Some additional flat kites we see in the example on the left, another train kite, and then the upper right hand image, a delta kite. The first kite I ever had, I got when I was six years old and it was a delta kite and it was all black and it didn't have any stickers. And I thought it was very unusual for a child to have a kite that was all black, but I had the best time flying that kite. I wanted it to be a stunt kite but it wasn't the right shape, unfortunately. And in the lower image there, we do see a sled kite, a single line sled kite. Some examples of box kites. My dad had a couple of box kites. They're fascinating. Here's another sled kite and another beautiful train kite. Two examples of rotor kites. You could see with the image on the left how that would how it would rotate through the air. And the same for the image on the right, how it would spiral through the air. Here are a couple sport kites. One's the dual line on the left with just the two lines. And then you see the four lines for the quad on the right. Here are the power kites I was talking about. Kite surfing or kite boarding. There's kite sailing or kite kayaking. And then bow kites, which are used for various other extreme sports. Unusual kites. They can fall into a few different categories. The one on the far left would be a non-traditional rotor type kite. The ship. Um, I'm bordering on whether that would be a figure kite or some type of modified box kite. And just a couple other interesting kite images there further to the right. Here are some, the next two slides are images of kite festivals that happen in different seasons in different places around the world. These here are all flat kites. They fall into the inflatable kite category. Here we see winter, winter images and looks to be a mountain image of a bird kite, bird train kite on the right. For those of you that are interested in more information other than this brief history of kites or the different types of kites that are available, I encourage you to check out the International Kite Flying Association, the Kite Trade Association, American Kite Flyers Association, and you can visit them at www.kite.org. And finally, Hoosier Kite Flyers Society at www.hoosierkite.org. And the Hoosier Kite Flyer Society is still active here in Indiana. They have most of their events over on the eastern side of the state. And if you're interested to see what they have upcoming, particularly in the month of April, given that this is National Kite Month, uh, I encourage you to check them out. For those of you that saw the, the Facebook post for picking up your free kite craft kit from the second floor reference desk, we still have some of those kits available if you're interested. Um, I encourage you to pick one up um, as soon as the library opens and come up to the second floor reference desk and ask for your uh, kite kit and we'd be happy to hand those out to you. They will be available on a first come first serve basis through Friday, April 23rd um, or until they're gone. And I really hope that you enjoy putting these together. They're traditional Mekong pocket kites. So they're made with bamboo, uh, bamboo skewers and traditional origami paper. It's proved to be fun craft. 
as always, I want to thank you for tuning in tonight. I hope you had a little bit of fun, maybe learned something new and pick up a kite craft kit from the second floor reference desk. And I hope that everybody stays tuned on our social media, uh, both Facebook and even on our website. Check out our upcoming programs. Uh, we'll be releasing new information here in the next couple of weeks on uh, the next program that I will be having. And I hope that all of you that tuned in tonight will tune in again. And I look forward to seeing you uh, in the library as well. Have a great evening. Good night.